everyone. It's Judy Warner. Welcome back to the On Track Podcast. Today, we're joined by John Coonrod, the Technical Marketing Manager at Rogers Corporation. Rogers makes incredible high-speed and high-performance laminates. And today, John is going to talk to us about insertion loss and microstrip and strip line circuits and how to get the most out of your design. So lean in, enjoy. I'll see you on the other side. Welcome to All Team's On Track Podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Hi, John. Welcome back to the podcast. We're delighted to have you today. Hi, Judy. Happy to be here. So today we're going to talk about insertion loss, what it is and how it behaves with different types of structures, uh, particularly micro strip and strip line. So first of all, I think a working definition, I think most design engineers understand insertion loss, but a working definition of insertion loss, and then we'll, then we'll jump in. Right, right. Yeah, actually, if you don't mind, maybe what I could do is back up and go through some of the basics of how circuits are made, just so everyone understands what a microstrip is and what a strip line is. I, probably, I bet your viewers already know this stuff, but maybe it's good to go through the basics anyway. Do you think it's okay place to start? Yeah, I think that sounds great. Go for it. All right, good. I think I'll do that. And actually, I got a couple of slides I want to talk to, so let me give that a try. Um, to begin with, uh, some of these um, things I'm going to talk about are, you know, like buzzwords, so to speak. And uh, if you give me just a second, I'll share my screen. And one of the buzzwords would be the core material. And the core material is also called the laminate. And the laminate is a simple copper clad um, laminate that I'm showing here. Let me blow that up a little bit. So uh, just to make a very simple two copper layer circuit, double-sided circuit, you can simply take a copper clad laminate and selectively etch off the copper that you don't want, leaving behind the copper you do want for the circuit traces. And that could be a microstrip circuit. Microstrip is very simple, just a signal conductor on top, ground plane on the bottom. And it's used uh, a pretty good amount in RF applications and some high-speed digital, even though, to be honest, high-speed digital uses uh, strip line a lot more than microstrip. But that's just a simple way to think about making a, a uh, two copper layer circuit. And then to move on to make a little more um, complicated, I suppose, would be a three-layer circuit. And a three-layer circuit shown here, and of course, I'm going through this in a very simple manner. Actually, building these circuits is more complicated than what I'm talking about. But uh, anyway, for a three-layer circuit, what you can do is essentially the same thing. Start off with a laminate or a core material, selectively etch the copper that you want to go away, leaving behind the circuit image you do want, and then use some prepreg, which are bonding materials that will adhere different things together. In this case, we would adhere a top copper foil. Copper foil is kind of like aluminum foil when you're cooking, you know, except it's, it's copper in this case. So you go through a process of lamination, glue it all together, and voila, you got a three copper layer circuit that is a strip line circuit, and the electrical configuration is ground signal ground. And that's shown in the middle there. And then also I'm showing a cross section at the bottom of a strip line circuit using RO4000 materials. And this is using a lot of RF applications and a lot of high speed digital applications. Um, the drawback, as you could probably imagine, is the signal conductor is buried and you don't have direct access to it electrically. And that's where plated through hole technology comes in. And uh, after you've made the three-layer circuit, you can drill holes in very specific areas, and then you would plate copper everywhere on the top and bottom surfaces and through the holes. And then you'd go through a process of selective etching the top and bottom planes to get what you want. And I've got kind of a 3D view on the bottom right there. And now you do have electrical access to that buried signal layer. And again, a lot of uh, high-speed digital uses this type of configuration, but a lot of times what they use is differential pair, where the signal layer actually has two signal conductors side by side. 
So that's a real quick overview of how to build a, a two-layer circuit and a three-layer circuit and plated through-hole technologies. Is that a good starting point, you think? I think that's a great primer for our conversation. Okay. So um, I'll, I, I forgot to mention to our audience, if you can um, consume the video version of this, John is showing some good slides, but he's going to... Um, for our listening audience that doesn't have access to video, um, he's going to try to explain everything in a way where you don't have to have the images, but um, I think it would bring a lot of light to the subject matter if you have a chance to go to our YouTube channel and take a look at the, the video version. So, okay. Um, so you want to talk about insertion loss now? Yeah, let me give or, you a, a little more. Or shall we go? Okay, so then <laughs> so, let's go. Yeah, well, I'm going to follow do, you, John. I oh, don't. sure. Okay. No, <laughs> what I kind of wanted to do, now that I kind of showed how to build the circuits, I was going to show how they behave with electric fields applied to them and things like that, and then finally get into insertion loss. Perfect. I, I know it's kind of, you know, uh, you probably already know all this stuff, but to be honest with you, it's just, it's good for everybody to go through, even if they do know it. Sometimes it's good to see it more than once or in a different way. For sure. Even, even I, you know, come from manufacturing and RF, it, it's just always a good refresher. And I feel like I pick up something every time and appreciate you going and sort of laying the groundwork in order. So you just keep me on track, John. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, so anyway, let me show my screen again. And uh, since we already talked about how to build a microstrip circuit, I thought I'd show you what it looks like when you have a cross-sectional view with electric fields applied. And actually what I'm showing here is a microstrip signal top ground plane on the bottom and the blue lines are the electric fields and the magnetic fields are wrapped around the signal. And basically as these magnetic fields and electric fields vary in time and energy, they create a wave that comes out of the display at you. And that's the wave, the wave propagation that you really want as a designer anyway. And then in the bottom right, I'm showing just the 3D view again. I guess I didn't talk too much about how this is used. I'll, I'll say that real quick, but microstrip is normally used in RF applications at microwave range of frequencies. And microwave range is around 300 megahertz to about 30 gigahertz. But we have seen this structure used at higher frequency. It gets more difficult as you go to higher frequency, but we have seen it used at 60 gigahertz and a fair amount at 77 gigahertz for auto radar applications. So that's a quick uh, RF side of the microstrip. And then strip line, um, same type of thing, cross-sectional view, and I've got kind of a coarse drawing there, but what I'm trying to show is electric fields, which are dark, I think black, <laughs> and then wrapped around that are the magnetic fields, and then the wave that comes out of these fields varying with energy and time comes out at you. And this is used a lot at microwave frequencies and some at millimeter wave. Uh, millimeter wave is about 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. And um, the difficulty is when you go to higher frequency or higher speed digital, is trying to get the energy effectively or efficiently in and out of that buried uh, signal on the interlayer. So a lot of times this is used at lower frequencies or lower rates for high speed digital but uh, just due to the evolution of high-speed digital, this is being used more and more, and it is becoming more of a challenge to be able to get that energy in and out of that uh, buried signal layer, but that's just kind of the, the things that the designers need to work through. Well, so, and I think this is a really helpful example showing how the fields are moving because that's not always evident. Right. Yeah, it's sometimes good to kind of get an idea of what's going on for electromagnetics because we talk about these propagating waves and I'm a visual guy and I just assume everyone else is. <laughs> but it's nice to see that stuff sometimes, I think. Same here, John. Yeah. I think it helps everybody, actually. Good. Well, let me um, talk about insertion loss then. Perfect. Um, so I have something else to show there as well. So let me share that real quick. And insertion loss is actually made up of four different components. And there is conductor loss, dielectric loss, radiation loss, and leakage loss. Leakage loss I'm not going to talk about, and a lot of times we don't talk about that because it's usually not that big of a deal because 
the volume resistivity and the laminates that are used in the printed circuit board technology is such a high volume resistivity that leakage is not a problem. If you're using semiconductor grade material, which purposely has lower volume resistivity, eh, then you could have some issues there, or if it's a very high power application. But anyway, I'm going to kind of ignore that one today. And also radiation, I'm going to uh, ignore radiation losses. And the reason why is because radiation losses has a lot of variables to it, a lot of things related to the design and just a lot of different things. And the data I'm going to be showing today, uh, it's really not pertinent. So I'm really just going to focus on conductor loss and dielectric loss and kind of keep it simple there. So this is uh, showing three different charts of circuits that I tested and also have models uh, part of these charts. And uh, all of the circuits are using the same material. It's 4350B with half ounce copper. And the circuit in the middle has a legend, so I guess I'll start with that. The thick purple curve is actually the measured data. That's insertion loss going up to 20 gigahertz. And at 20 gigahertz, it has a loss of about 0.7 dB per inch. And then the other curves are actually showing a model. And the model, the green curve is the total loss or the insertion loss. And that model matches the measured results eh, pretty close, good enough for what we're doing anyway, as an example. And then the red curve is the conductor loss and blue is dielectric. And in this case, for a 10 mil thick substrate, 50 ohm microstrip transmission line, there is more conductor loss than dielectric losses. However, if you go to the chart on the left, using the exact same material, except it's thinner now, 6.6 uh, .6 mils thick. What happens is going thinner and trying to maintain 50 ohm impedance, you need a more narrow conductor. A more narrow conductor means you have less conductor for the RF energy, and that means you have more conductor losses. And that's why you see the insertion loss did increase to about 0.9 dB per inch at 20 gigahertz. And the reason that increased is really because the conductor loss has increased. And conductor losses are related to, of course, the conductor. And a lot of times it's related to either a metal finish that has plated the conductor or the copper surface roughness. And the copper surface roughness that I'm talking about is at the copper substrate interface. And then as a reference on the far right is the same type of uh, chart, except now it's using thick substrate, so 30 mils thick. And for 30 mils thick, the ground and the signal plane for this microstrip are so far apart that the copper surface roughness doesn't matter as much. And now the conductor effects, the red curve is less important. And the blue curve, which is dielectric losses, is a lot more important. And that has to do with dissipation factor. So quick summary there is a thin circuit's very sensitive to the conductor effects and a thick circuit's very sensitive to the dielectric effects, which is dissipation factor, or tan delta, something like that. So that's a quick overview of insertion loss as a microstrip transmission line. Does that make sense, you think? That makes perfect sense. I also noticed that um, this is you're on the Rogers 4350B laminate here. Right. And um, I think that's significant to mention as well, since you have a whole product line. Um, sure. 4350 is quite commonly, is that your most commonly used laminate, I, would you say, John? I think it is. By volume, I think that's the, the laminate that we sell the most of. It's just because it's a really good high speed and high frequency laminate. And it's friendly to the fabricator. So some it's of these laminates, so friendly to the fabricator. <laughs> yeah, some of the laminates are less friendly, like some of the PTFE laminates. They're a little more yeah. difficult. But 4350 behaves in the process of making a circuit kind of like FR4. You still have yeah. to adjust parameters here and there, but you know, overall, it's pretty friendly to the process. Yeah, I I I can tell you that from experience that 4350 is a lot easier to process. Um, but there's some cases you can't use it, but wherever you can, right. it's good. I just think that in, I think that's important to mention in context of your slide that right. if you could do this on a bunch of different materials, but Definitely. I think having the reference of a commonly used one is, is a good idea. Right, right. Yeah, every material's got pros and cons, of course, and same with 4350. So really what it is for the designer, they just need to understand, you know, their application very well and talk to the material supplier and make sure they're choosing the right material for what they're doing. It's pretty basic. You mentioned about the final plated finish oh, on the right. circuit having an effect. Can you, can you um, share with the audience about that a little bit? Because I think it's an important point. 
Yeah, actually, that's one of those topics that comes up a, more than you might think, um, because it's, it's not easy to model that sometimes. So a lot of times in simulations, the designer does not account for the uh, plated finish. And that does have an effect on insertion loss and phase response and other things too. And actually, I've got a slide. If uh, Give me a second. I might be able to share that as well. And it's showing the effects of um, the uh, plated finish. And in this case, uh, this is ENIG, Electrus Nickel Immersion Gold. And nickel is about one quarter the conductivity of copper. And because of that, you're going to have more conductor losses, which means more insertion loss. Uh, and ENIG does cause more losses, but also it is a good finish. I, I don't want the viewers to get the wrong idea. ENIG is actually a really good finish to use for wire bonding, for long-term issues. It, it really is. But the designer just needs to be aware it's going to cause more insertion loss. And that's just kind of the nature of, uh, uh, the, nature of the beast. <laughs> anyway, this is, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I think it's a really interesting point. And again, speaking as an ex-fabricator, I can't tell you how many it, engineers, design engineers would become aware of this fact, and then they'd say, well, just plate it with gold. Mm, right. You know, paint the gold right on the copper. And uh, I was right. like, no can do we, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> right. Um, there's process problems that you, you can't do that. So you need a right. barrier between the copper and the gold because the metals can actually um, pollute the gold bath. It, 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 it so... Um, yeah, that's, that's why true. it has to be there. Right. And, and there's other things like any pig, right? Oh, um, yeah. Other things, but this is really the most commonly used thing by most designers and it is largely desirable, but you can't right. really skirt around the nickel. So I just wanted yeah. to mention that here. Okay. Yep. So talk us through this slide, please. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so really this is a study that we did, uh, I think a year or so ago, and we asked the, the circuit fabricator to build circuits for us. And we measured the bare copper circuits. And then after that, we had them apply a thin layer of nickel and then the gold on top of it for ENIG. And that's the orange curve. And then the gray curve is the same thing, except we asked them to plate much thicker nickel. So 62 micro inches for nickel on the thin side, 175 micro inches for nickel on the thick side. And that's a pretty dramatic range. Even though nickel does vary from batch to batch or even within a batch, the nickel thickness does vary. And um, this is probably an extreme, I'll be the first to admit it, but it does give the designers an idea of what kind of variation they can see from one circuit to another uh, as you're building circuits on large volumes. So the nickel thickness and how it varies, and it, there is normal variation, that's just part of the process, uh, that does cause some difference in insertion loss. And if the application is sensitive to insertion loss, then of course, that's something to be mindful of. Something I'm not showing here, though, is uh, the, the plated finish also has an effect on phase response. And phase response is pretty important on radar applications. So for some of the 77 gigahertz automotive radar, uh, having consistent phase response is a big deal. And having variation in the nickel can be um, something that the designer price should be mindful of anyway. So what advice would you give John to design engineers? I mean, if you're saying that the nickel can vary even within the same lot of boards, how do they account or, or model for that to right. make sure they're in the, they still remain in the range they need for performance. Right, exactly. And uh, what they really should do is talk to their circuit fabricator and get a good understanding of what the normal variation is for nickel and then establish a good model that has the nickel, cop the copper, nickel, gold all in the model, of course. And once you have a good model, then vary that nickel thickness as much as the fabricator would tell you and try to get a sense in the model of how much uh, differences you'll see and then see if that stays within the, the loss budget or not. But that's about the only way I can think of, of dealing with that. But yeah, staying in close touch with the fabricator is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, do you hear my big sigh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, I'm always like, talk to your fabricator. Absolutely. But it's, it's hard to accomplish sometimes with schedules and deadlines. But I promise you people, and John can attest, if you spend a few minutes syncing up with your fabricator, the amount of pain that you can eliminate is very high. 
Absolutely. So um, I'm going to just keep singing that song till they. I agree. <laughs> I'm pushing up daisies, I swear. Yep. So, um, and also, uh, I don't know if this applies here, but it came to mind. I, I also wanted to mention that in that particular slide that you just showed us, I noticed that that's on Rogers 3003, oh. which is a little bit different composition of right. laminate and um what about solder masks and final finishes sure actually if you give me a second let me go back to the slide real quick because okay it, it is using uh, there's when you do these type of uh, plated finish studies you got to be mindful of the test vehicle in this case what i used was five mil thick ro 3003 with rolled okay. copper and the reason i use that test vehicle is because uh, 3003 is extremely low loss, 0 0.001 for dissipation factor. So that means the dielectric losses are not going to be significant in this study. And then the use of the rolled copper, that is very, very smooth copper. So copper foil, all copper foils have normal surface roughness variation. And from one batch of copper to another, that roughness variation can cause differences in insertion loss. So I did not want circuit to circuit evaluation that I'm doing here to be affected by that copper surface roughness variation. So that's why I use rolled copper. It's extremely smooth. So I knew that the only, the only significant difference in the insertion loss should be due to these bare uh, copper versus enig platens. So it's really looking at the conductor effects due to the, the enig itself and trying to ignore the effects of the dielectric loss due to the, the material and the conductor losses due to the copper. So that was the, the thought behind the test vehicle. But anyway, you had a, a good question about, was it solder mask? Yeah, just, yeah, oh, sure. solder mask and, and yeah. Yep, yeah, so we've tested solder mask as well. And um, of course, solder mask on strip line circuits are not that big of a deal because it's on the outer layers and you don't have the effect of solder mask on the inner signal plane. So normally not a, a concern there. Uh, for microstrip, it can be a concern because microstrip, as you remember from the picture I showed with the fields, you do have some fields that are in the air. So you have some fields in the substrate, some fields in the air. And when you have fields in the air, air is the lowest loss mechanism there is. So if you change that, those fields that are in air to having fields in solder mask, then the solder mask is gonna cause increased insertion loss. And that's just the nature of it. And then along with that, that can affect the phase response and how the circuit would perceive the dielectric constant, you might say. So now the, the wave propagating on this microstrip circuit, normally without solder mask, it has fields in air and substrate. With solder mask, it has fields in substrate, solder mask, and air. And the solder mask plays a bigger role because it is higher dielectric constant than air, and also it's got higher dissipation factor. So if you put solder mask on, you gotta be mindful that it is gonna cause an increase in insertion loss. And uh, we've done a fair amount of studies with solder mask, and we find that there's little differences here and there between the epoxy base to the acrylic base. And the acrylic base seemed to be a little bit less for lossiness. Lossiness? I guess that's a word. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, yeah. uh, the acrylics are a little bit better for loss anyway, but not, not a lot. I mean, there is just a slight difference. Uh, I, I have to give a shout out to our audience right now. First, if this is overwhelming, you're not alone. I have <laughs> been sitting, learning at the feet of John Coonrod for a long time, so I'm tracking with him. If this is overwhelming, never fear, because Rogers has an amazing um, <clears throat> tech hub that you can go register for free, and you can download, you can get calculators, you can... It's just a plethora of resources. So if you're overwhelmed, don't worry. There's stuff you can get on their website. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the Rogers Technology Hub. Join for free. I've been on that thing forever, and I've used it a lot. Um, and I'm going to share a bunch of links below mm -hmm. in the show notes. So a bunch. Okay. So just wanted to say that. Um, also to our listeners, another point I wanted to make was, I feel like there's another podcast here, John, don't oh, yeah. hate me, but the <laughs> no. other podcast is this, cause we're just like talking over the top of it because we're familiar with it, but different types of copper, rolled copper, uh, rolled annealed right. copper, all, all the different types of copper. 
right. and the effects that have on performance. So, and I think a lot of design engineers are being drug into the RF and microwave space, yeah. whether they want to go there or not because of things like automotive radar or IOT right. or, you know, they're going there whether they want to or not. So I yeah. think the knowledge you have to offer is really valuable. So yeah, yeah that's a good one. There's a lot to copper, a lot more than what uh, you might think about, but yeah. That'd be so a much topic. more. And yep. so anyways, to our listeners, if that's a topic you'd like to hear John and I talk about, just give me a shout. Um, if you want us to, we'll do it. Sure. Um, so let us know if that's a topic of interest and then I'll twist John's arm to come back in. And talk no through some of those things. Um, anything else we needed to cover? I think that's most of what I had in mind. Anything else, John? No, that's kind of the highlights. Um, you, insertion loss is a big topic. I mean, we could go it on is. for a while. <laughs> I know. That's, that's a good overview, I think. So. I think it's a good overview. And again, it's like drinking from the fire hose. So I don't want to... <laughs> Yeah. I don't want to overwhelm. I, so thank you so much for coming sure. on today and giving sure. us this good um, overview and for sharing your, sh for sharing your slides. Yeah. And um, we'll make sure to, you know, offer the video version of this plus all the resources you have available. And thanks so much for all you do for the industry to, to help us keep up with technology and have successful designs. Great. Thank you very much. To our audience, thanks so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this conversation between myself and John Coonrod of Rogers Corporation. Be sure go to the show notes, tap into all those great resources. Let us know if you want to hear about copper types and how that affects your designs. Until then, just remember to stay healthy, stay safe, and always remember to stay on track. <laughs>